Okay, hello Dan, hello Tom, hello uh, Dick, and hello to everyone else who might be watching this on YouTube. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Bob Quima. I'm at the uh, Louisiana State University Center for Computation and Technology. I've been doing some work lately with 3D stereoscopic panorama rendering, and I wanted to make this video just to bring you up to date with, um, well, with the progress that I've made. I've made a lot of very good progress, and some nice interactives are coming out of this. Let's take a look. Okay, let me start things up here. I've got a simple example panorama. This is a basic um, spherical panorama. This happens to be an image of the Wisconsin State Capitol Dome in Madison. This image was captured by Dick uh, Ainsworth, who was kind enough to supply me with several high resolution panoramas for my testing. The source image here is 28,000 by 14,000 pixels. That's 374 megapixels or 1.46 gigabytes at 32 bits per pixel. Now, this computer has a GeForce 8800 with only half a, byte, half a gigabyte of VRAM, so the image is larger than can, than can fit in the graphics card's memory. So what we're in fact seeing is uh, a large number of small images, 128 of them in fact in a cache, which you see here. Each cache page is 512 by 512 pixels, which at 32 bits per pixel works out to one megabyte per image. Um, these images are tiled onto the center of a sphere, and um, as we move about the sphere, the selected subset of images changes as new parts of the sphere come into view and the associated sub subsets of the panorama are loaded, uh, loaded from the hard disk. Um, if the cache is already full, then the pages that haven't been recently used get to ejected to make room for them. Now this is not the highest resolution panorama ever captured. Uh, Gigapan.org has examples in the hundreds of gigabytes. What makes this interesting is that it is in fact two panoramas side by side. Let me switch, switch to a stereo configuration here and play this back. Okay, here we see a left-right stereo configuration. You could, uh, you could in fact play this video on your stereo TV and see it in 3D if you want. On the small screen, you can cross your eyes and view this as a cross-eye stereo pair. As we pan and zoom around the scene, the, uh, the 3D view and the illusion of death persists no matter where we look. If I turn on the cache view, you see what is apparently two caches. They're in fact identical. Uh, the one cache is drawn for both your left and right eyes so that your depth perception isn't confused by the disparity. If we look close enough, let me zoom in a little bit here, we see that each page in the cache is doubled. That doesn't mean that each page is included twice, but that the cache holds a stereo pair of images for each page on the sphere. That is, two panoramas share one cache. The double panorama consists of uh, 0.73 gigapixels of memory. That's, uh, it's close to three gigabytes of, of raw data. So with our cache size still at 128 megabytes, we're starting to see some really efficient data management. It's this stereoscopic aspect that leads us toward the point. Uh, one might wonder why I bother to do this work when software like Gigapan and Deep Zoom exist. Well, the emphasis on uh, my work is on real-time immersive interactivity. I've done a lot of work with uh, large data sets mapped onto spheres. My dissertation work here demonstrated hundreds of gigabytes of information not only rendered in real time, but adaptively processed and composed and manipulated. This was all targeted toward displays such as this one, the Varrier. It's an immersive, autostereoscopic, very high-resolution, cluster-driven display. Um, the capability also led to installations like the moon wall at the Adler Planetarium. Nice big wall there. Uh, it's involved work on domes and, uh, well, things like the, the star cave. Here's, here's what that looks like there. Well, Tom. All of these systems are scalable, real-time things that, um, that leverage stacks of computers and piles of screens to display far more information than any one computer is capable of handling, and to do so in a real-time immersive interaction. And while Gigapan is awesome, it's just not mappable into this context. 
Back when we were discussing the improvements that we wanted to see in VR panoramic display, one of the biggest problems that needed solving was simply being able to switch between images easily. Uh, early implementations of this software would try to load the entire file at the beginning when the program was started. Uh, it, first off, this placed a hard limit on the maximum file size because it had to fit entirely in, in VRAM. But it also took a lot of time to do that, 10 or 15 seconds just to switch from one image to another or longer. And this kind of uh, interrupted the flow of your demonstration, standing there waiting in VR with nothing happening. So, but with this out of core paging mechanism, it's more or less instantaneous. So let me show a few here. Oh, uh, let's see, we, uh, here is uh, Blue Mounds. Bing, there we are. We've seen this one already. There's a couple of good ones here. Uh, these are, uh, Dick sent me a whole bunch of images, some of which are, are really great. Here's a Taliesin Garden. There's a nice vase here. Actually, um, in this one, ah, here he is. There, there's a, the photographer has photographed himself there. Let's see. Bouncing around here, a lot of teas. Ah, here's a, here's a sailing ship. Little sailors. This is mildly amusing. Apparently, these uh, these girls were getting their picture taken. By the time the uh, the robotic camera got around to photographing the photographer, he was no longer there. So they're posing for no one. Anyway, so so this autocore paging business makes it instantaneous to switch files, but it goes even further than that. If we load multiple panoramas for for stereo viewing, then um, we can clearly load multiple related panoramas and allow for smooth blended transitions between them. So, so not only can we switch instantaneously, we can switch smoothly. This is a garden path at Taliesin, the studio and home of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and we have eight panoramas here actually. And uh, by loading them all uh, more or less simultaneously, we can interpolate between them. Eight steps, smoothly changing. Here's a little Buddha. This is 16,000 by 8,000 pixels uh, times eight images, or right around one gigapixel total. That's four gigabytes of, uh, of raw data. All of these images share the cache, and uh, we, we even have the opportunity to do some pre-caching of upcoming frames here in order, to, in order to ensure smooth transition. Works very nicely. You see there's a lot of cache traffic here when we have two high-resolution stereo panoramas being uh, transitioning from one to the next, with the third one being pre-cached. Now, the video you've been watching has been captured on my development machine, which is a Mac Pro running OS X with a GeForce 8800. It's an aging machine. Um, the screen capture utility can only capture 720p at a reasonable frame rate. So what you see is not actually performing very well. In order to con better convey a, a sense of real-world performance, here's some camera footage of the 8-step path interpolation running at 1080p on my Linux workstation with a GeForce. G6470. It's displayed on that stereo TV. This is a bit of a stress test as the time variable is always changing. The view direction is moving at a constant angular velocity, so any jitter in the frame rate would be apparent. But as you can see, it's nice and smooth despite a great deal of cache traffic. This is made possible by the fast rendering as well as Linux's excellent I.O. latency. And this is the type of performance we can expect on the Star Cave and the Next Cave and the NG Cave and uh, VR systems like that. Now let me talk about zooming a little. Zooming a gigapixel panorama is a very natural thing to do given its resolution. However, zooming is normally done in one of two ways. If you want to see something better, then A, either you just make it bigger, and this usually works in 2D, like looking at maps or something, photographs, or you, you, you narrow your perspective projection on it. That works in 3D. It's like looking through a telescope. Unfortunately, in VR applications, we can't do either of those things. If we take our, our sphere and just make it bigger, well, we don't perceive any change because it's just growing away from us. Similarly, in VR, we're not allowed to change the shape of the perspective because the shape of the perspective is known. It's determined by the locations of the screen corners as well as the locations of the user's eyes. So to zoom a panorama in VR, we need to do something a little bit different. Instead, when we're zooming this here, 
instead of just uh, scaling things or changing the perspective, we actually warp the spherical coordinates used to map the image onto the screen. So we can see in the front here, the image is getting larger as I zoom in. And similarly in the back, it's getting smaller. Now moving on to another issue, the issue of cache thrashing. For those unfamiliar with the term, thrashing is the condition where the amount of data needed to render a single frame, let me bring something up here, the amount of data needed to render a single frame is greater than uh, the amount of data that can fit in the cache. This means that at least one of these pages is getting kicked out of the cache and reloaded into the cache every frame. This incurs a very heavy I.O. load, leads to a catastrophic drop in performance. Your hard drive starts to rattle, your frame rate drops down to a couple frames per second. Um, so let me cause this condition to occur. Changing my config file here. Now this can happen with a normal least recently used cache protocol. And so what I've done is developed a, a more intelligent uh, thrash resistant protocol to account for it. Um, so here we see the 3.92 gigabyte stereo panorama, nearly three gigabytes of data running in only 32 megabytes of cache. And I can still zoom in nicely. And you see the, you see the cache on here is, is absolutely tiny. Now this works, uh, this, this should be thrashing. But it works because the system is capable of uh, detecting when thrashing is occurring and switching to a modified cache ejection policy based on page resolution. And one of the one of the really nice emergent behaviors of this policy is that a thrashing cache will naturally seek a steady state where the uh, resulting output gives the highest possible uniform resolution across the entire screen. Uh, that is to say, it omits high resolution pages in favor of a set of low resolution pages giving a constant pixel density, uh, the fewer discontinuities, better perceptual uniformity, etc. And plus, when it converges finally on the, alt on the optimal page set, it's stable and it incurs no additional I.O. until the view again changes. So here we have three gigabytes of stereo panorama data being rendered using only 32 megabytes of VRAM. One final issue that I'd like to discuss here um, with regard to rendering is the question of sampling, subsampling of imagery. Let me load up a test data set here. There's another Taliesin data set. And of course, we zoom in and we see all these little pages and they show us one large coherent image and that's great. But uh, when you zoom all the way out, that's a different issue entirely. Uh, here we're seeing about half of the panorama at once and you certainly don't want to load half of the pages in order to show half of the panorama. So therefore pages are subsampled into uh, pages that have lower resolution and wider coverage and you can display them at low resolution. But I wanted to really spend some time and effort in, to ensure that these subsampled low resolution pages still are a good representation of the high resolution image that they represent. So I developed a, a variety of different ways of looking at these things. Um, here's what we're seeing. Now, here's the first step. If we were, for every output in the image, every output pixel in the image, if we were to fire an array in the source data set, this is what it would look like. It's terrible, there's moire on the roof, and the ferns and trees are just noise. Um, usually what you do with mipmaps like this is you downsample them, them, downsample them using a 2x2 two two box filter. That looks like this. It's a little better, there's still some moire here. I wasn't satisfied with this, so I implemented an adaptive filter. This recursively subdivides each pixel depending upon how much contrast there is in it. It works pretty good, but it's really, really slow. So I ultimately went with this. This is stochastic sampling. It uses a Poisson disk pattern to fire rays into the source image. And it makes a big difference. Here's the worst possible solution. Here's the common solution. Here's a good but slow solution. Here's the best one. Poisson disk sampling looks like this. Little dots, none of which are too close to each other. Okay, that's about it for this video. Um, in a future video, I will take a look at the other application of this technology, and that is planet rendering. Essentially, instead of being inside the sphere and looking out, you're outside the sphere and looking in. I have some very high resolution planetary data, uh, including some new data from the moon, uh, a color map, and also a height map from which we'll derive a normal map. 
And of course, I've got the old familiar Earth data that we'll, uh, we'll look at too. Hopefully, all of this will come together into what will be a nice uh, upgrade for the Moonwall project.